this psalm in particular is just a little bit different than most psalms. It's, it's what we would call a didactic psalm. And the word didactic means instruction or learning. And the purpose of this psalm is to, is to remind its readers and instruct them and, and really remind them of God's faithfulness in and throughout their history with the Lord. And then it also reminds them of also the time in which those before them faltered, perhaps, and how God dealt with those areas. So the whole purpose of the psalm is, is a didactic psalm. It's a psalm of learning, a psalm of instruction. And so this is what we are continuing with. And remember, the author of the psalm, his name is Asaph. And Asaph was a worshiper in the house of the Lord. Asaph was a man who understood what it was to be in the presence of the Lord. And so a lot of what he's writing here um, in regards to Israel's history, well, the way they worship the Lord was in light of God's dealings with them in their history. And so they look back to God's, you know, time of perhaps maybe his blessings and his uh, work over their lives, but also they would look back at to the times that the Lord corrected them and the times in which God delivered them and the times in which God healed them and God provided for them, but also in the times in which God chastened them and corrected them. And so ultimately, a man like Asaph would have a greater understanding with the presence of the Lord than most people because his ultimate job was working in the tabernacle of the Lord. And this Asaph is the individual that is believed to be one of the Levites who was ministering in David's day. So not only was he acquainted with Israel's history, he was also serving in one of the greatest times of the history of God's people, Israel, when David was king. Now, you know, guys, listen, to this very day, David is viewed as the greatest king Israel ever had. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but he is viewed as that. And even to this day, every year when we go to Israel, I'll tell you there's so much tribute to King David there because the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, view David as the greatest king Israel ever had. And in the last days, David will rule. As he comes and rules and reigns with the church during the millennial kingdom, David will rule and reign again in Jerusalem at the second coming of Jesus Christ. What a remarkable thing. And so here, this man Asaph had an amazing relationship with David. And this was a man who was not just, remember we studied a little bit the life of Asaph, he was also regarded as a man who was a prophet. And, and they said, you know, set apart the prophets, Asaph and David. And King David is also known as a prophet because the Psalms that David wrote, some of them were very prophetic in nature, talking about Jesus, you know, uh, years before Jesus even came on the scene. And so some thousand years, if you will, before Christ came on the scene. And so David was regarded as that, but also Asaph. And Asaph, it's believed, there in the Chronicles, when David gathered the Levites to, to minister, remember David said, gather those who prophesy with the harp. And that's an interesting statement. How do you prophesy with a harp? Well, remember that the harps that were played during that time, it was David who put this great, uh, you know, orchestra, if you will, together, this great choir of some 4,000 Levites. Remember that? And he also, them with their children and their families, there was a multitude of them, and they all played. They had about 4,000 stringed instruments playing at the same time. And see, these stringed instruments have about 22 strings on them, which are representative of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so some would say that this was the first text scene that was ever created. They were able to communicate each string represented a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So without a word, they were able to communicate. And the point that's being made is that Asaph is one of these men. The music was prophetic. It spoke concerning the Lord. And this is what worship is. Asaph knew worship. He knew uh, what it was to be in the presence of the Lord. And so this is the man as kind of just referring back to. And so as we read this psalm, you'll see why, you know, we have to kind of look at this and get an understanding of why Asaph is writing the psalm that he's writing. So remember that ultimately it was God's kindness to a rebellious Israel. God's kindness to a rebellious Israel. And we looked last time that we were here at uh, uh, verses 40 down to verse 55. And those were the verses that we looked at last week. And we, 
And we titled those verses there from Egypt to Canaan. And this was Israel's failure to remember the power of God and how God brought them. You know, one of the worst things we can do is forget what God has done for us. And, you know, it, 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 your relationship with the Lord, in a sense, loses its substance, not because God has lost its substance, but we lose the heart of what God has really done on our behalf. And so that's why, in light of the New Testament, which we are New Testament believers, correct? We live in light of the cross. One of the greatest works that God ever did in the history of humanity is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so this is how we have come to the place that we are today. And what place is that? Well, it's not attending the Sunday night Bible study at Living Way Christian Fellowship. It's that we come to this place where we stand spiritually before the Lord and that we stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our sins have been forgiven. We have been made right with God. And we are a righteous people because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so this is what's so remarkable about our position. So God does a great work among his people, but at times people fail to remember the vast and powerful and miraculous work that God has done. You know, sometimes, guys, when we forget, and I think all of us have treaded on that a time or two, the best thing to do is start talking about the cross. Start talking about Jesus. And oftentimes people wait to once a year to do that. Right around the time of Easter, we talk about the work of the cross on Good Friday, but we're to talk about the cross daily because this is what has made us what we are in that we are right with a holy, righteous, living God. So I say all that to say that this has been the didactic teaching and instruction in this entire psalm where Asaph is encouraging the people, remember the Lord your God. Remember what the Lord your God has done for you. Remember the faithfulness of the Lord your God. Why? Because remembering God's faithfulness always encourages God's people. Amen? And sometimes when you look to the faithfulness of God and how he delivered and how he brought his people out of bondage and delivered them and set them free, I don't know about you, but anytime I read these stories in the Bible, it always encourages me that no matter what I face, God is faithful at delivering his people. Asaph says in verse 56, he says, yet they tested and provoked the Most High and did not keep his testimonies. As we look at this psalm, we're kind of breaking into the tail end of this psalm. And remember that ultimately he had just spoken in verses 40 down to verse 55 in regards to how God delivered his people from Egypt. And remember, the work that God did in Egypt was miraculous, right? Every work that God did, he defeated the false gods of Egypt. And in defeating the false gods of Egypt, what he did was he showed them that ultimately the gods of this land, which really are not gods at all, okay? They're not gods at all. There's only one God, the Bible says, the Lord God. There's not, you know, a multitude of gods in heaven and God had fought all of them and he won and he's the victor. No, there's never been no other God. It's been him this entire time. And so, yeah, we have in the scriptures, a multitude of gods that people have served, but they're false gods. And they're only as strong as the people make them in their minds. That's as far as they go. That's why Psalm 115 says that these idols, they have eyes, but they can't see, ears, but they can't hear, mouths, but they can't speak. They are deaf, dumb, and blind, and so are they that make them and worship them. But the God of Israel destroyed the gods of Egypt, ultimately revealing to the world power of the day that the God of the Hebrew people that were subject to the power of Egypt was greater than any God in the land of Egypt, even greater than the Pharaoh of the day. And when God delivered his people and brought them out, obviously he brought them to the wilderness. Now, as you look back, you'll see that really, if we were to take this psalm and we were to say, well, what part in Israel's history are we at? The last time we looked at God's deliverance of his people from Egypt. Well, this now brings us to them being in the wilderness and coming to the promised land and how God had promised them an inheritance. And God surveyed that land for them. And the Lord made tribes for Israel and they dwelt in tents in the wilderness. And God surveyed the land. And remember, this is what he did in the book of Numbers. He numbered the people. Remember that? And how he said, so many tribes will go to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. You know, so they all directed all four areas. 
and the groups were coupled together and the tribes were there. And so when the people would look upon God's people, Israel at this time, they would see a vast group of people dwelling in tents, but yet they were led by their God. We know that God was faithful in leading his people for the 38 years in the wilderness. And ultimately, it was a time of 40 years from the time that they left Egypt to the time they went into the land of Canaan or the promised land. But 38 years they wandered in the wilderness. 38 years God led them by a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day. God was faithful to his people. The Bible goes on to say that not even their garments worn out, not their shoes, nothing. The Lord was faithful. He provided the means for them over and over again. And you could say that verse 56 probably would bring us to the place of Deuteronomy chapter 1. In verses 1 and 2, there at Kadesh Barnea, where now the Lord will speak and reiterate and remind this new generation of the law. That's what the book of Deuteronomy means. It means the second law. And remember that during this time in the wilderness experience, a generation died. A generation had to die because of unbelief. And God was raising up a new generation. And Joshua would be the leader that God would use to lead this new generation into the promised land. But notice that even the generation that Joshua led, guys, listen, after about the second and third generation, by the third one, that generation was committing the sins of their ancestors over again. And so ultimately, we'll see here how the Lord dealt with his people after all that the Lord had did for them, after the Lord, how he... Um, allotted them an inheritance, it says in verse 55, by survey, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. And, and notice that the Lord was clearly working among his people. It says, yet they tested and provoked the Most High. Listen, when you look at verses 40 down to verse 55, you'll see everything the Lord did for them. We already went over this last week. But in this last section of verses 42 through 55 that we're looking at tonight, we see the Lord showed his faithfulness. And in, excuse me, in verses 42 through 55, tonight in verses 56 through 72, the Lord shows his faithfulness once again. And after all that the Lord had done for them, the Bible says here in the middle of verse 56, and did not keep his testimonies. Once in the land of Canaan, or the land of promise, the people failed to keep what God instructed them during their time in the wilderness. Remember, it was in the wilderness where God gave them what? His law. He gave them his oracles. And God didn't give his oracles to no other people but the people of Israel. They are the only people, the group of people on the face of the planet that were given the very oracles of God. That's why when you read the book of Hebrews and you see in the New Testament, they were a group of people that had a special place on this earth. Why? Because these are the people that God chose to give his name to, if you will. And not only his name, but his word. And so Asaph is saying the very same people did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their father's. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. Now, think with me for a moment. For two generations, the people obeyed, I guess you can say. But the third generation began to repeat what their ancestors did. And we see that it was in the time of Joshua that we began to see this begin to start. Yes, God gave them victory and favor as they went into the promised land. But it wasn't much longer there that the people turned to idols and begin to worship the false gods of the Canaanite people. And notice what we see here. It says that they turned back and acted unfaithfully. This is a didactic psalm. In other words, what Asaph is saying is, listen, wisdom is that we don't turn back and deal unfaithfully. You know, think about this for a moment as the story begins to build up. Consider this as the term that he uses. He says, they turned aside like a deceitful bow. What good is a bow that cannot be trusted? It's useless. And in Psalm 78 and verse 9, we see the term of a bow also being used. But this topic of a deceitful bow has been brought up also in the book of the prophet Hosea, chapter 7 and verse 16. In Hosea, chapter 7 and verse 16, it has the same idea of really being a bow that is inactive and unreliable, useless. In other words, it could be used for nothing. And this is exactly what the people have brought themselves to 
when they turned back from obeying the word of the Lord. And what did this do? Well, they provoked him. They provoked the Lord. They provoked him to anger with their high places. High places is always the altars that are not to the Lord, but to false idols. So they provoked the Lord by worshiping the idols in the land rather than utterly destroying them because ultimately, what did those idols do for them? Those idols didn't bring them out of Egypt. Those idols didn't deliver them from the circumstances and situations that they were in, but yet this is what they reverted to and begin to worship these idols and they forsook the Lord their God. They forsook what God had did for them. And so they become like a deceitful bow and it is deceitful. But it's also useless. And so we see here that they provoked him to anger with their high places, with their idolatry. You should circle that. Idolatry, guys. What is idolatry today? Well, you know, some people think that an image and an idol is idolatry. And to a degree, yes, that is the common reference to idolatry. But idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in your life. Some people have asked the question, am I a, 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 an idolater? Well, you're the only one that can answer that question. You might say, well, what is idolatry? How can I know if there's idolatry in my life? Listen, the thing that consumes your time more than your relationship with the Lord has become an idol to you. Now, I'm not saying that we're to disregard things in our lives and not pay attention to things. I think we need to be responsible people, but what are you living for? There's a way to live on this side of heaven, faithfully before the Lord, and God really at the forefront of your life without your life being consumed by other things that really lead to nowhere. And sometimes people spend a lifetime living their lives that way. And then they realize that this entire time how they lived was an idolatrous life. And they lived in idolatry because the focus was not the Lord and they worship things other than the Lord God. And, and remember that... Um, where we devote our time, well, devotion of time is worship. Because a devotion of time requires your heart. It requires something being heartfelt. And this is, this is what you've given yourself to. And so we should only be given, giving that very thing to the Lord God and Him alone. You see, sometimes people think worship is a set of songs and the raising up of hands. No, that's a part of it. That's an act, but that's not worship itself. Don't ever get that confused. Theology of worship will never teach you that. Within the theology of worship, as a matter of fact, music is not even one of the pillars of worship. The pillars are obedience. The pillars are faithfulness and being submitted to the Lord God. Those are the pillars of worship. And that comes as an act of the heart. Everything else is an act, outward expression that is, you could say, the byproduct of what's taking place inwardly. And so worship really is to be given to the Lord and the Lord alone. This is why we were created. We weren't, when people say, well, you know, we were created to worship God. Well, what does that mean? Well, the person who doesn't understand what true worship is, they'll say, well, we were created to sing songs to God. Uh, no. We were created to honor the Lord God, to bring glory to his name and to worship him for who he is because he is God. And that comes as an act of the heart. And everything becomes worship unto the Lord. How you live is worship unto God. How we deal with day-to-day -day things is an act of worship and service unto the Lord. And so here, a person who gives his self in other ways, what they were doing is they were looking to the idols of the day to help them. They were looking to the idols of the day in how they were to look to the Lord and him alone. So in other words, what they were doing is, remember that this was always an issue with God's people, right? They, when he brought them out of Egypt, yes, he delivered them, but what did they do? They brought the idols of the land of Egypt with them, and didn't God have to rebuke them? He says, put those idols away. And then they go into the land of the, uh, of the people of Canaan, and, and they begin to conquer the land, and yet they're, once again... They're still possessing these idols. It's like as if they never really let go. And the ones that never really let go were the ones that struggled the most. But the ones that let go and said, God, it's all of you. Those were the ones in which God was able to work through 
and fulfill his purpose. But at this point here, Israel faltered big time. They provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy. Guys, listen, we know that the Bible says that our God is a jealous God, right? He's a jealous God. Now, now here's another thing about the jealousy of God. T just take note of this, okay? How God is jealous for us is not how people are jealous for one another, okay? Okay, God's not some weirdo, man, you know? hounding their spouse and, uh, you know, around there, just weird stuff. Who are you talking to? Who are you with? You know, where are you going? How long will you be there? When will you be back? That's not, he's not up there paranoid, worried, okay? That's not the God that we serve, all right? When it says that God is a jealous God, it's that God will share his glory and his worship and what is due to him with no one. God doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. So the point that it says that God is a jealous God, it means this very clearly, is that God wants you solely for him and himself alone. And if he's not willing to share you with any other, then why are we willing to share him with any other? That's not the way it works. And so he's jealous for you in that regard. And ultimately, I think that's a good jealousy. The world doesn't offer this, only God can. There's a balance in his jealousy where in the world, jealousy just leads to more wickedness. But notice that they moved him to jealousy with their carved images. In other words, the Lord is saying, listen, I'm, I'm not here to be one God among these other gods that you think are real gods, but they're not. How do you get a person to really understand that what they're doing is wrong? I mean, ultimately, listen, sometimes you just want to you know, beat people over the head and be like, man, listen, think about what you're doing. Think about what you're thinking. But sometimes you just can't do that. And ultimately, God will deal with these people the way he's dealt with his people in his word. It still continues today. But I'd rather get it before the Lord has to deal with me. And so sometimes it's always wise to listen and pray as to what you might be doing or getting yourself into. Ultimately, at the end of the day, this is what I always tell people. You're going to do what you want because your heart's already set on it. One of the biggest lies even I've seen in this church and even among leaders in this church, and I say this truthfully because I see it, is that they lie to themselves in thinking that what they're really doing is wisdom and it's of the Lord and it's not. But how do you get them to hear perhaps what the Lord is putting on your heart to say, yeah, it's not wisdom. Oftentimes they have no desire to hear. You can't force someone to hear. You can't force someone to obey. Obedience is an act of the heart. They're either obedient or they're not. They're either hearing from the Lord or they're not. There's no in between. Well, maybe they are, maybe they're not. No, it's either yes or no. And how do we hear from the Lord? Not because it feels good or, you know, I got the goosebumps, man, or I just know it's right. Or, you know what, it just happened on this day and this day in this year, this happened. No, listen, God's not into all that weird stuff. So what is God speaking to you through his word? Through his word. You see, it was his oracles that he gave to his people. If God, a holy, righteous God, gave his people his word, it's for the purpose of obeying his word. Allowing that very word to be the direction. What they did was they said, Lord, yes, you gave us your word, but we like what these idols are saying to us. What were these idols saying? I mean, the Bible says they have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. It's interesting how you can conjure up something that doesn't have the ability. So many people do it. So many, like in this case here, we're not talking about heathens here, guys. This is a didactic psalm. These are God's children, and they're missing it. Just like today, God's children miss it today, even here in this church. So important for you to look to God's word and say, this is where I'm moved, and this is where I'm led, according to this very word of the Lord. You know, boy, I tell you, the Christian faith is very difficult today to pastor. It's unbelievable how society has influenced the culture today. Boy, I'll tell you, pastors are preaching and teaching to an, a very emotional group of people. Bless you. 
very emotional. What you see today are more decisions made in my pastorate of almost 10 years, 95% of the decisions I've seen made in my pastorate have all been emotional decisions. The rarity today in my pastorate is when somebody comes to me and says, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Lord instructed me to do, so I'm going to do it. Very rare. And when I see it, it's like, do it. I mean, that's God speaking to you. Do it. But usually it's decisions are made by how we feel. It's made according to the feeling at the moment. Well, you know, and remember, that's one of the lies of the enemy. If it feels good, do it. Not everything that God calls us to do feels good. Anytime God is working in you because he's dealing with your flesh, it's never a good feeling. It's, it's a stretching, right? And the Bible says that your heart will deceive you. Your heart, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, is deceitfully wicked. Think about that. So you can't trust your heart. You know, how do you know? Yeah, I just feel it in my heart. Ooh, whoa, oh, wait. You know, how many mature Christians even tell me that? It's like, hey, Pastor, bro, I feel it in my heart. It's like, you are crazy. Like, you know what? Hey, what? You can't force someone, right? People are going to make the decisions they want to make, and so be it. All you can do is just say, Lord, I pray for them. You know, you know? I, I mean, you know, before I used to try to, no, don't do that. Don't. But after a while, like the Lord says, they need to learn. And I'll wait. And they ask me, they say, well, what do you think? Well, first off, I want to deal with what you said. This is what I tell them. You said, well, you know, in your heart you feel this. Well, there's a problem with that. Why? Because your heart deceives you. So now you're ready to hear what I have to say. Well, yeah, okay, I'm going to tell you. You don't have to listen, but here it goes. You ready? You're wrong. You need to get back, refocus, pray, get in the word of God, and let the Lord speak to you. But the hardest thing is that from now until God speaks to you, your biggest battle is you've already vested so much into your emotions, it's going to be hard for you to hear from the Lord. So your battle now is to get out of this emotional, feely, feel type of relationship you have with God and get back to the white and black relationship with God, right? Isn't that what it is? There's no gray with the Lord. It's either white or black. It's either yea or nay. It's what the word of the Lord says to do or not to do. That's what it boils down to. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, what is it that drives and leads a person? What is idolatry is when we exchange what God has given us to be the very means by which we live and we replace it with something that has the idea of wisdom but is not wisdom itself. It has the look of of power, but is not power itself. It has perhaps even the name God, but it's not God itself. This is what idolatry is. And the wisdom that the world offers you guys is another idol. We call them ideologies or ideologies that people have, but that's what they are. They're the philosophies of the day. Those are the greatest idols. This is why people are so emotional. You guys, you know, listen, it's interesting. We, 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 have, a, we have a course description that we're doing in our, um, in our uh, Bible college on the topic of counseling. And one of the biggest misconceptions a person can make going into taking this class is to think that counseling started with psychology, it didn't. Counsel started with the Lord God. That's the beginning of it. Psychology will tell you that man is the beginning and the measure of all things, a lie from the pit of hell. Counsel from the Lord God, which he created, existed before man was even created, reveals to you and I that God is the beginning and the measure of all things. The problem with today you know when the Bible says in Matthew's gospel that even the elect will be deceived? Friend of mine, this will be the deception in the last days. Where people think that the Christian faith is about intellectualism and philosophies and wisdoms. No, it's not. The Christian faith is about faith itself. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. That is faith. Now I'm not saying there's no need 
for intellectualism or an intellect in the reading of the Word of God. Yes, we need to be smart about how we approach and read the Word of God. There should be some academia there involved in how we look to the Lord, but we should never allow how we discern from the Lord those things to be the deciding factor. It's faith. And so, statistically, it's been proven that, you know, I would say 40 years ago, you know, maybe 50 years ago. Nobody went to psychologists. You went to clergy. You went to pastors for counsel. They had to deal with all kinds of stuff. Why? Because everything that this world will deal with, and some people say, well, this age is different. No, listen, friend of mine, now you're like the scoffers of Second Peter that say everything is uniform. Now you're involved in uniformitarianism, which is a false deception of the enemy also. Everything is uniform. It's been as it's been since the beginning and, and all this. No, listen, that is not the case. That's not what the scriptures teach us. But ultimately what you find is that idols are a work of the enemy to distract you from hearing from the Lord. And you'll never hear from the Lord. You can, the Bible is, is not saying that you cannot, you can do whatever you want. Ultimately, what you do will produce fruit. And for the believer, Jesus said in John chapter 15, he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you and I appointed you that you go and you bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. The fruit that you produce with the Lord remains the fruit that you produce from the bad ideologies and the philosophies and the wisdoms of the day, the idols of the day, will be bad fruit. It's never good. Let me give you guys an example from a man who's not an educator. I have the education of a GED, and I got it when I was in prison. I went to the ninth grade. It's as far as I made it in school and didn't even finish the ninth grade barely finished the eighth grade. I don't even think I did. I don't know why I was bumped up to ninth grade. But anyways, that's my education level. But what I've seen throughout the years, I'll tell you guys this, I had to sit with a shrink and I remember them diagnosing me with multiple personalities and schizophrenia because, you know, I was a drug addict and, you know, so here I am in prison in a pill module. You don't go to a pill module in prison unless they think you're crazy. And what I realized there is that a majority of these people, yes, to a degree, some can be sick because we live in a fallen world, but ultimately, they just need to be delivered by the power of God. Amen. And it's true. God has the power to deliver. But the false ideologies of the day is that God can't deliver because they confuse. You see, there are times that God heals and there are times that he doesn't heal. And, and, and God didn't heal every person in the Bible. Some of these ailments and infirmities served God's purpose in other ways. But the world will tell you, we see, well, religion can't help you if you're, if, 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 if you're crazy or you're, you, you, need, you need therapy and you need a psychologist and we, we need to get down to the root. of. And even churches have bought into this false teaching. They call it deliverance ministries. You ever heard of that? That after you get saved, they believe you could still be demon-possessed and they have services that focus on you being delivered after you've been delivered. Doesn't make sense. See, I'm more old school with it, right? If somebody tells me this person's crazy, they're out of their mind, they're talking to their this or that, I, they're, they're crazy, you know, they, they, need a, they need a shrink and then they're bipolar or they're multiple, they're talking to their this or that. When they tell me that, you know the first thing that comes to my mind? And we just need to lay hands on him and cast a demon out. I'm just that old school. And I will go. If I'm given the permission and the ability, I'll go. I'll say, let's do it. Let's lay hands on him. Let's get, let's get him delivered and set free because God has the power. I'm not going to sit there and be like, well, what brought you to this place? It was sin, man. I know the story. Genesis chapter 3. It came into the world. And man has been dying ever since. And God provided the way of escape through his son, Jesus Christ. I will not in no way ever buy into the philosophies of this day. Because all it did for me was send me to prison. That's it. That's it. Wasted years of my life because I thought the world knew it. 
but it didn't. It didn't. And the most secure and sound thing I've ever done in my life is accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And for the last 17 years, my life has been blessed. And I still talk to myself <laughs> every day, but I'm not crazy. And sometimes I answer back. I'm sorry, I must say. But I thank the Lord that when I talk, He hears. Amen? Sorry I had to go on that rant, but sometimes people, when they look at the word idol and they, they displace themselves, they say, wow, well, good thing is I don't worship any idols today. No friend of mine, there are many idols today, and idols have crept into the church, and there are more people in the body of Christ that are idolatrous than they realize. When God heard this, he was furious. His fury turned them over to his enemies. Look at and greatly abhorred Israel. You see, guys, what was taking place here was that the Lord heard of their idolatries. The Lord seen. And the Lord became upset. He became angry. It wasn't a bad anger, a sinful anger. It was a righteous anger. And it put Israel in a place where the Lord was not looking upon them favorably. In other words, you know how the Bible says in the book of Romans that ultimately what happened is a person that continues to reject the Lord and reject the Lord, ultimately the Lord will just give them what they want, right? He turns them over to a debased mind. Doesn't mean that they cannot be delivered from that. Ultimately, like I said, when a person already has his heart on, set on something, listen, they're going to do it anyways. They're not going to receive instruction. The last, you, ever, you ever met a person that calls you and asks you your advice and then you give it to them and then they don't even listen to it? Well, I tell you. It's like, then why are you calling? Are you calling me because you want to let me? Just tell me what you're going to do rather than ask me, what do you think? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think and, and you better be okay with it. I mean, obviously, you're, you're calling because you're not sure yourself. Don't ever make a decision off of emotions, church. Please don't do that. So what did the Lord do? So that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. You see, Shiloh was established by the Lord himself in Joshua chapter 18 and verse 1. Remember, it was the place where God put his name. Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle of the Lord rested. And remember, the tabernacle was a very important thing in the land of Israel, was it not? It was the very place where the sacrifices and offerings would be offered up to the Lord. And remember that the tabernacle prior to this would, would move about. Remember that. And, and, and it had a permanent dwelling place at Shiloh. It was the place where God put his name in. And it's the place where the people could meet with the Lord. And remember, it was where the tabernacle of the Lord were, was and the priests would offer up offerings and sacrifices to the Lord. And... Behind the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, where they would experience the presence of the Lord, that glory cloud, the Shekinah glory of the Lord, would be there. And Shiloh was the place where God put his name. But it goes on to forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent that he had placed among the men. In other words, remember, in the history, not too long after the people came into the land, remember that this is kind of how the history goes. Remember, God led his people out of Egypt into the wilderness. Who led them in the wilderness? The Lord did. But who did God raise up to lead the people? And after the people, a generation died in the wilderness. Moses had to stay, couldn't go into the promised land because of disobedience. And who did God raise up to take the people now into the promised land? And after Joshua, who did the Lord raise up? Oh, you guys were doing good. Not Deborah. It was the time of the judges. And the Bible says that the people did what was right in their own eyes. And ultimately, the Lord was judging his people while these judges were being raised up. And it was a difficult time in Israel's history. Because the people were doing what was right in their own eyes the entire time of the judges. And after the judges, who was next? Wrong. 
wrong. The priest and prophet Samuel himself. And he led the people. And then it was after Samuel, the prophet of the Lord, that ministered as priest to the people, the Lord raised up the kings. And then what you see, ultimately, God working among his people in this way, when God removed himself from the tent that he had established in Shiloh, it was during the time of what priest? Eli. Remember the story in 1 Samuel. When the Lord had been among his people, but yet his people over and over did what was right in their own eyes. And even Eli was a man that the people did not respect. And Eli's sons were men who were deceptive. Men who were abusing God's people at the tabernacle in Shiloh. And ultimately we see that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was lost by Eli's sons in battle. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. And remember that Eli, when word got back to him that the Ark of the Covenant was lost to the Philistines, because here's how the story went down. You see, before, when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was created, that became the very place where the mercy seat was. Offerings would be offered up and sacrifices would be offered up. And this was the place where the glory of the Lord, he would meet with the high priest that would offer this up. And sometimes God would instruct his people to take, he would tell the priest, you take the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord into battle. And remember that this is what they would do. They would take the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord first, and the priest would go, and then the army of Israel would follow behind. And what were they constantly seeing over and over as they were going into battle? What was it that they were looking at? They were looking at the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And ultimately... It was reminding them that God would be victorious on their behalf in this battle. So their eyes were, so now by the time that Eli's sons were in the mix, listen, their hearts were not right. There was many issues with Eli's sons. The problem was that Eli was a bad father, a bad leader, because he never corrected his sons. And the people lost all respect for Eli. He was letting his sons sin and sin against God's people. And they abused the authority and the position of their father. And Eli never corrected them, ever. Samuel fell into the same thing later on in his life too. And ultimately at the end of the day, because Eli, for whatever reason, didn't want to correct his sons, well, it led to their own demise, even his demise. And so what did his sons do? We need to go fight these Philistines. Okay, well, let's go. Let's take the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. I mean, hey, it's been taken in battle before. The only difference was that before God instructed the people to do it, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, God never told Eli's sons to do it. What they relied on wasn't that it was their point of faith. No, it wasn't. They relied on methodology. And they felt that this method would win the battle. What happened? They took the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord into battle and they lost it. And the sons were killed. And their dad heard that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was lost in battle. And the Bible says immediately he fell over and he died. And then his daughter-in-law, who was pregnant, when she heard that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was lost in battle, she immediately went into labor. Right there and gave birth that very day. With that tragedy, her husband dead, her father-in-law dead, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, lost to the Philistines in battle. And guess what she named her child? Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. And from the time of 1 Samuel chapter 4, pay attention to this, guys. Away to 1 Kings chapter 8, the glory of the Lord never dwelt among God's people. It had departed. It had departed. It wasn't until Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8 built the temple of the Lord that the glory of the Lord filled the temple again. So this was a great loss. And it changed a lot of things because remember what the Lord says, where I put my name, that's the place where I will be worshipped. So Shiloh was a big deal. Shiloh was a big deal. Now, there's a lot more to this story. Obviously, there's rich history here, but I'm trying to give you guys 
piece by piece and bit by bit so that way we can kind of get an idea. And he goes on to say here in verse 61, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. What does it mean here? That he gave his people over to the enemy. The enemy was able to possess God's people because this is what God's people really wanted. They weren't trusting the Lord God for their deliverance. My question tonight is, are you trusting the Lord God for your deliverance? Are you truly looking to the Lord to deliver and to help you and to set you free and to do a work in your life? Are you truly looking for the Lord to fight on your behalf? Or are you relying in methods, relying in, in emotions or wisdoms of the day or philosophies of the day? Or are you truly looking to the Lord God and saying, Lord, the battle belongs to you. And I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to remain firm in my faith. And I'm going to receive the instruction of Asaph here in Psalm 78, the didactic psalm. Yes, I will receive this instruction and I will learn from it. And look at what else he goes on to say here. He also gave his people over to the sword. In other words, what did he say? Not only did they lose the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, but many people died. Not only was the glory of the Lord gone, but people lost their lives. And was furious with his inheritance. He's talking about Israel. The fire consumed their young men. And their maidens were not given in marriage. Why were they not given in marriage? One reason could be that there was a scarcity of men. Because so many lost and died. And why is that a problem? Well, that's a threat to the generations of men continuing on. and going. You know, guys, listen. There is a threat today to the generation of men and continuing on and going forward. You know, some people think it's these... Wars that we're out and getting ourselves into. No, listen, wars have always been a dynamic of the human race since the very beginning. And that's why the Bible says in, in Solomon's wisdom, he says there's a time for war and a time for peace. I mean, these times are there. Now, listen, I, I'm not for every single war, but I am for defending the freedom and the liberties of people. And I'm, and I'm proud of, of what this country has been able to do. Whether it's been frowned upon by others, at the end of the day, only God is the judge. But notice something. I don't hear anybody complaining when our young men are giving their lives for the freedom that we have to preach the gospel without restraint. Some have given their lives for me to preach over this pulpit tonight. So you don't ever treat the teaching of God's word lightly, not only because it's God's word, but blood has been shed. Not only the blood of Jesus Christ, but the blood of men and women. And many that have been martyred for the faith. And ultimately, what we see here is that there was a scarcity of men. There's a scarcity of men today, not because of wars like I told you, but there's a greater war where there's a scarcity of, of men in the area of marriage, guys, for the purpose of procreation. And that is this whole homosexual agenda that we see today that is required supposedly by various facets of what people would call the church. I don't call it the church, but they would say, no, we need to embrace this. Well, then that's the threat of the next generation. But oh, we live in a society today where it's not like it was in biblical times. So Pastor David, if you're not embracing this or, or okay with this and you want to know what, then, then it's probably not good for you to be preaching because you know what? You're outdated and uh, so is God. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I'm not opposed to the people that engage in this lifestyle like anybody else. They're no different than what I was before I gave my life to the Lord. They're sinners in need of a Savior. Is there a place for them in the church? There's a place for sinners in the church, yes, and that's the place of repentance and turning to the Lord. Of course there is. Is there a place for sin to be practiced in the church? Obviously not. These women couldn't give themselves in marriage. The solemnity of marriage really was at stake here. And they were not given in marriage, perhaps maybe because of this, but it affected everything. It affected the next generation and moving forward. Oftentimes people don't realize how much their idolatry affects them and others. Their priest fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Notice that. Then the Lord awoke from sleep. 
like a mighty man who shouts because of wine. Doesn't mean that God drinks, okay? And it doesn't mean that God is asleep. The point, it's more of a phrase than the actuality of it. Because nobody can say that God was asleep. Because nobody can say that they physically saw that he was asleep. It's a phrase. The Bible says in Psalm 121, the one who keeps Israel never sleeps nor slumbers. The point that's being made here is that for a moment, God allowed the enemies to overcome his people. In other words, he was inactive in defending them, not because he was not capable of. He chose not to because he was giving them what they wanted. They wanted to be ruled and conquered and defeated. Why? They were worshiping pagan idols. When you give yourself to those things, that's because you desire what they have to offer. The end result is death, separation from God. And what I love about the goodness and the grace of God is that he never forces himself upon anybody. Fine, if that's what you want, so be it. And it doesn't mean that if you pursue those things that you can never come back to God. He's full of mercy, he's full of grace, and he's full of love. Yes, come back. There's always hope because of who God is. He is hope. But what it means is that now God is saying, okay, now it's time for me. Because it would seem that from the point that he was dealing with in verses 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, guys, 62, all the way here to 64, was a generation. And now a new generation has arisen from verses 65 and on down. And so now what is God doing? Doesn't he always deal with every generation differently? He gives every generation an opportunity and always warns the next generation to not visit the sins of their fathers. And the Bible says that his mercies are new every day. Isn't that awesome? You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, guys, God could have easily been done with his people, but he didn't. He continued to give them chance after chance after chance. We serve a God that is so gracious, so good. Amen? Amen. And I love that about the Lord. Man, I don't know about you. Maybe you haven't. I don't know if you guys have this problem, but I've blown it more than once. You probably haven't, but I have. And I thank the Lord that he's gracious and he's abundant in mercy. And he's abundant in love and grace. And I'll tell you, sometimes it just humbles me. And I think to myself, Lord, I deserve none of this. And he's not up there saying, yeah, you know what? You don't. You really messed up, but I'm going to go ahead and forgive you. That's, God's not even like that. We're like that, but the Lord's not like that. His mercies are new every morning. He scatters our sin as far as the east is from the west. You know what I love about that verse? Got, does anybody like that verse? You know what's so amazing about that verse? He could have said he scatters our sin as far as the you know, south is from the north or vice versa. But both of those directions have a north pole and a south pole. They have an end to them. East and the west doesn't. It's continual. It's forever. And that's the whole picture. That he scatters our sin as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? No man knows. But it's far. And if they're scattered that far, then ultimately God remembers our sins no more. Amen? Amen? And so God, the phrase will say that God woke up, but he wasn't asleep, okay? And now his attention in fighting for his people, the Lord, with a new generation, fought back the enemies. And who was that new generation? David. Didn't God do some amazing things under David's reign? Did he not? Wasn't, guys, listen, here's what's so amazing about David's reign. David defeated the enemies of the Lord. And you know what David did? David always took it personal. Oh, he did. He didn't take it personal when people messed with him. He proved that in his fleeing from Saul. If he would have took it personal, he would have killed Saul. What David took personal is how people spoke against his God. When David saw Goliath, remember that? Awesome story, right? <laughs> when David saw Goliath, you know what he said? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the Lord God of Israel? He was a kid. And here you have grown men in an army rattling at their knees. They're clacking. 
And this one man named Goliath had them at bay up on this ridge on this mountain. Their king, Saul, was fearful. You know, typically the king is supposed to lead people in battle. Saul had no desire to fight Goliath. And David on an errand from his father to go and give sustenance to his brothers that have been on the battle line for a period of time. Remember what the Bible says, that Goliath taunted the people of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. And he would come out every day. Come on, let's do this. None of them wanted to fight. David all of a sudden goes and he comes during one of these episodes where Goliath is taunting. And David's like, you know, it's like, you know, you're taking something. You look, you're like, what's going on over here? It's exactly what David did. And his brothers are like, get out of here. We know what you're over here for. He's like, what are you talking about? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies? We know what he's doing, David. Just go, get out of here. And they tell David, this is what the king's offered. You know, David's like, I don't care about the offer. What I'm concerned about is that this man is speaking against the God of Israel. So let me go talk to this king. And David goes and David says, I'll fight Goliath. The king says, look at you. He's just a kid. The Bible says he was a ruddy little boy. And ultimately, what David was, it wasn't David's willingness. Some people say, oh, you know, well, I'm willing to do this, I'm willing to do that. Yes, are you willing to do everything God's called you to do? That's what was so special about David. It wasn't David's willingness. It's what David believed and knew about the God of Israel. I mean, talk about inexperienced from the vantage point of warfare and battling, when Saul says, well, you know, you know, this is probably a little bit too much. Oh, no, it's not too much for me. You see, I'm a shepherd. Probably like, you're not even a warrior? No, I'm a shepherd. And I take care of my father's sheep. And sometimes when I'm out there, if a bear or a lion comes and steals one of these sheep, the Lord gives me the power to go and take that lamb back from the bear or the lion. I've destroyed both bear and lion with my own hands by the power of God. And all he was saying was, I'll do the same to him. Well, go ahead and go. Okay, so what did Saul do? Saul tried to get his part in there. Put my armor on. It's hanging over David's hands. Saul's boots probably reached all the way up to David's thighs. He didn't have anything, really. It was too big for him. The Bible says he couldn't even fit in it. It was just way too big for him. Couldn't walk in it. Couldn't move in it. And ultimately, David says, I don't need this. And when David spoke to Goliath, remember what Goliath said? You come to me with, the, you come to me with this little slingshot. You come to me like, like a little kid, you know, with sticks. He say, this is embarrassing. You come to me with this, and do you not know who I am? And it's like Goliath gave David the opportunity to run away, and maybe he was incur probably reminded him of himself. The Bible says that Goliath had been a warrior since his youth. But Goliath probably said, poor little guy. And David says, listen, you come to me with that spear. You come to me with all that you have, your ability and your warlike mentality. But David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And he will deliver you into my hands. And he defeated Goliath just like that. You see, David was a man that understood the power of God. And when did David understand it? When David was a nobody. When David was in the shepherd's fields, taking care of his father's sheep. Remember when the Lord told Samuel to go and anoint a new king after Saul had died? Remember that? And, and, and uh, the Lord says, hey, go. I've already chosen a man after my own heart. It was David. And remember when, when Samuel went to go anoint the new king? Remember that? And, and ultimately, this is what it did. The Lord told him after Saul died, David was already anointed. And then Samuel knew there that after, what did the Lord say? He says, hey, Samuel, stop crying. The king has already been chosen. Samuel knew who God chose. He went and anointed David years before. But remember that even Samuel got it wrong. Remember? When he saw David, he's like, this couldn't be the one. Yeah, it is. That's the one. Wow, okay. He anoints him. I honestly believe that Samuel, to a degree, didn't really believe that this was God's choice. Because why did Samuel grieve the way that he grieved when Saul died? And the Lord says, hey, listen, stop crying. 
The king's already been appointed. This is a king after my own heart. Saul was known in the kingdom. His family was known. He had history. David wasn't known. But the great things that God did through the life of David is amazing. And this is now where Asaph takes us. And he says this, and he beat back his enemies and he put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Remember, Ephraim was the largest tribe. It was the royal tribe. But he chose the tribe of Judah. This is where now the transitioning takes place. You see, under the old generations, it was the tribe of Ephraim. Remember that God always looked to Ephraim. He always mentioned Ephraim. Sometimes the name Ephraim was used interchangeably with Israel. But now he chose the tribe of Judah. In Genesis 49 and verse 10, it said that this very tribe here is a tribe in which the Messiah would come forth. And then what did he do? He forsook Shiloh. And what did he do? He blessed Mount Zion. The Bible says which he loved. The Bible says in Psalm 47 and verse 4, in Psalm 87 and verse 2, that the Lord loves Zion. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he had established forever. He also chose David, his servant. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, you see the anointing of David. And he took him from the sheepfolds. David was a shepherd of his father's sheep. You see, the Ark of the Covenant in David's day was lost. It was, it was among the presence of the Philistines for a season and then was moved to a land or a place called Nob there in Benjamin. And David would be the one that would take the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and bring it to Jerusalem. And what's so interesting is remember that Jerusalem, guys, was a Jebusite city. Shiloh is where God put his name, but David conquered and defeated this Jebusite city that sit upon a hill. And David made this the very capital of Jerusalem and the Lord honored it. And now the name of the Lord was no longer in Shiloh, but was now in Jerusalem. And you know what's interesting? At the end of David's life, not only was David the one who captured this Jebusite city and made it the capital of Israel. He made it the center of Israel and God honored it. But another thing happened at the end of David's life in 2 Samuel, you'll see in chapters 23 and 24, David committed a horrible sin. That's the second greatest sin in David's life. The first was with Bathsheba. Cost the lives of five people. His second sin cost the lives of 70,000 people. And then David had to purchase a piece of land to offer up sacrifices to the Lord. So he went and he purchased the land of a man by the name of Aruna. Remember that? And he purchased this land. And here's what's so remarkable, guys. You don't understand this whole picture here of what the Lord was doing. God was orchestrating this whole thing. Why is this so important? Let me tell you why. We always hear of the story of Genesis chapter 22 when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, right? It's the first time the word love is used in the Bible. Did you know that? You read through the book of Genesis, you won't see the word love until you get to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2. And it says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. The first time the word love is used in the Bible is there. And we know the story. He ultimately takes Isaac up there, prepares to offer him up as a sacrifice. And right before he's going to kill him, the Lord stops him, provides a ram. The ram there is sacrificed other than Isaac. And then it says here, now the Lord God knows that you love him and you will not withhold nothing from him, not even your son. Well, that mount that God told them to go to was Mount Moriah. One side of Mount Moriah is the Jebusite city. The other part of Mount Moriah, it, Mount Moriah was the threshing floor of Aruna. And during David's reign, he possessed the entirety of Mount Moriah before his reign ended. Why did David do that? Well, through David's lineage, according to Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel, when you read the genealogy of Jesus, David is within this genealogy. Jesus will come from the seed of David, if you will, from the lineage of David, ultimately to fulfill what God desired to do in Genesis chapter 22. It was a picture of God offering his son Jesus. And Jesus walked the very same mountain that Isaac walked. The same way that Isaac walked it with the wood on his back. Always remember what the Lord or Abraham told his son Isaac when Isaac said, Father, we have the sacrifice, we have the offer, we have everything here. We're prepared for the sacrifice, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide for himself the lamb. 
Remember that? Well, the Lord never provided the lamb in Genesis 22. It was a ram that was caught in the thicket. Where's the lamb? Jesus is the lamb. That's why John the Baptist said in John chapter 1, when he saw Jesus coming down to the Jordan, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is what's so powerful about David's story. Asaph is saying, do you understand how gracious and how good and how powerful our God is? He is sovereign. He's completely in control. And let me tell you something. Man can plan his ways. But man's ways come to nothing. God is in control. And even though today the world and its system and its philosophies will tell you that he's not, they'll say your God's asleep. No, he's not. The one who keeps Israel never sleeps nor slumbers. God is sovereign. And I'd rather trust in the sovereignty of God and his ability to do. Why? Because his word has proven to me that our God is faithful. From the following of the ewes, this is David, that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. In other words, the Lord, where did the Lord prepare David? In his battle with Goliath? No. He prepared David when he was a shepherd boy watching his father's sheep. This will be the one who will shepherd my people, Israel. You know, kings were called shepherds. Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 6, Ezekiel 34. To shepherd Jacob, his people in Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them, talking about David, according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Guys, listen. It didn't matter if it was a bow in David's hand. It didn't matter if it was a slingshot, a sword. It didn't matter. Remember what David said? That the Lord teaches my hands to war. Didn't matter what it was in David's hand. The scepter as the king. Ultimately, David led faithfully and the skillfulness of his hands was the Lord directing him. Why is David called the shepherd of the sheep? Well, ultimately, guys, listen, kings were called shepherds in this day. And the Bible clearly teaches because the people were the sheep of his pasture. It's an old song we used to sing, and from time to time we'll hear it. And the song is taken from the Psalms here. In Psalm 77 and verse 20, and Psalm 100, 100 and verse 3, speak concerning us being the sheep of his pasture. David was a faithful shepherd, and ultimately, David's faithfulness is a result of God's faithfulness. And what did the writer of Psalm 78 reveal? Basically, what he was saying is, listen, though man is unfaithful, God is faithful. And God will always direct and lead his people. May we learn from the mistakes of the past, not to look to them and dwell upon them, but to respect the past and move forward into the future. God is faithful. Never lose sight of that.